everyone. I'm Adam Papagan. Welcome to the ASMR talk show, the show that feels good to hear. This is the public access show, YouTube show, Twitch stream, and podcast where we talk in uh, ASMR voices um, while we do the interviews, maybe some ASMR kind of others, some props, some stuff like that. But, uh, you know, just trying to expand the, the format on uh, all of those platforms. Uh, but when I was driving to the studio today, Actually, when I was picking up our uh, banh mi sandwiches that we always get for catering, I drove past uh, one of these uh, houses that's been reappropriated. It's probably additionally appropriated because it's probably also still a house, but uh, one of these houses where a psychic lives and has the big sign on their lawn. And it said, Psychic Readings, Palm and Card. And I thought, wow, that's really offering a diversified product because this has got to be like the biggest scam of all time. You just get a neon sign, put it in front of your house, and then hope somebody will wander in because they're into psychics. You have no way of knowing how good the psychic's gonna be. And I'm just thinking of the mentality of the psychics. Like, you know what? The palm reading has been going really good, but maybe if I fold in some cards, I could really capture more of the market. And then maybe she's thinking like, oh, should I get a crystal ball? Nah, that's too much, that's too corny. Um, I don't know, but I'm always, you know, impressed by the way people are able to um, uh, exploit things. Did the palms tell you something different than the cards? I don't know. If you know more about being a psychic, if you are a psychic, you want to come on the show. Um, because I'm convinced that psychics aren't trying to scam. They really do believe they have these powers. Um, but uh, I, I don't really know where I'm, I'm going with this. I feel like this is going to be a, a loopy episode in a good way. Uh, we got our new ASMR set up, and we've got a great guest tonight. He's a musician, he's a comedian, he's an activist. He's an activist, right? Yeah. Uh, Rob Patillo. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely, Rob. So you, um, you've done some public access before? Yes, um, yes. Quite desperation. Yes, and also I started at public access, learning how to do TV in uh, Danvers, Massachusetts, at Cablevision at 14 after I saw Wayne's World. That's when I started doing uh, public access at age 14 too, yeah. Gets in your blood. Okay, so we have that public access. You, yeah, it'd be easy. you get that look. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, um, wh what are some of the different shows you've done when you're kind of developing your comedic style, and, and you know, how did public access help with that? Uh, public access was invaluable because I happened to be with it before the internet. And so in order for me to do my own sort of talk show, which I did, which was called Can of Worms, I would have to edit on analog onto VHS, and then I would have to go to the various towns around Massachusetts. And the, the bicycling. Ah, uh, pretty much, yeah. yeah that's with what a basket, it. with like a... No, uh, they call it bicycling. Oh, oh, I thought you were taking your show. My transportation. Oh. Did you actually take a bicycle? Yeah, with a big basket with the VHS tapes in it. That must be why they call it that. And I brought it around to each of the wonderful, always courteous and caring program directors that never had any sort of power trip being at a public access station running it. Not whatsoever. No egos whatsoever from any of them. And um, I developed my chops as being a wannabe Tom Green prank artist and, and being eccentric and weird living at home at 25 and, and bringing that love to the public access world. And this was around the New England area? Yes, around Danvers, Massachusetts, where I was raised, which was formerly known as Old Salem Village, where they actually did all the wicked stuff to the witches, but they changed the name to Danvers, so that way they didn't have that bad rap. But Salem reps it, don't they? Salem reps it. Danvers is right next door and was Old Salem Village, and that's where they hung Rebecca Nurse, and they broke John Proctor with the weight, but they didn't want that reputation, so. But it actually happened in um, Danvers, yeah. Danvers. Yeah, and. Um, Are the sites still there? Yeah, and it's kind of depressing as a child to go on a field trip, and it's like, oh, here's Rebecca Nurse. She was a wonderful uh, lady in the 1600s. She loved to knit. Um, she could uh, also uh, farm, and here's where she was hung, and the body was never found. Let's have some buttermilk now. They never found the body? They never found the body. So, I, mean, uh, I mean, the body, we don't know where it's buried. I'm sorry. It. Okay. It's been like 30 years since the field trip. <laughs> yeah. They buried the body somewhere on the like uh, the family uh, uh, estate, and nobody knows where it is. 
And that's our field trips. It was a lot of wickedness. Oh, here's where John Proctor took all the weight on his back for refusing to admit he was a witch. And he, yeah, it, it was brutal. And that's where I grew up. So does that kind of, um, coming from a place like that, are there a lot of eccentric types like you who no. come out of that? No, no, it just, it goes the opposite way. No. People are just... I was never this eccentric around Danvers, Massachusetts. It was a yeah dude sports town with a lot of white, angry, male athletes. Ma mass holes, I think they're yeah. called. Yeah, all this was the creme de la creme. And um, I wasn't too dress-wise uh, eccentric. I did weird things, but... Um, yeah, it was very repressive in public access even. I had to battle for years to even get a show on the air that said the word suck even. And um, uh, a lot of public access stations around Massachusetts were very conservative and only focusing on school committee meetings, town hall meetings. And when somebody like me came in, it was automatically trouble. He needs to be repressed. Um, I had a television show at 17 pulled from the television station. So I went to college for FCC law and communications. And I went back to the station with the same lady and forced an internship up on her and made her life a little bit of a hell for, you know, about four years, like in terms of forcing her to do my show because I now knew FCC law, writing the president of Cablevision and imposing my will on the uh, station. It was nice. Well, that's what public access is all about, though. It should be ideally, yeah. but it wasn't. It was more like the uh, elders from the movie Footloose running yeah. like the stations. But you realizing that you could use the rules against them is a public access spirit. It, it, it was incredible, and I really enjoyed developing sort of my comfort level in front of a camera through public access, experimenting with skits and doing music, and it was pretty much um, the perfect time um, to segue into digital from that. You know, it was like having the 10 years of analog and public access and, and all that experience. And then around 06, when YouTube came into the picture, rolling over to a digital world. And it, it taught me a lot in spite of people's hatred of me for wanting to put on eccentric programming in old Salem Village. Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't even just the access station that was repressive. My dad was a Vietnam vet alcoholic who wanted everything normal at home, even though he was sort of the weakest link for that, and um, a lot of bullying at school. So it was like public access, um, AOL hometown websites were my only form of expression for the longest time. But then you got out of the Northeast. Escaped. Escaped. And pretty much, um, I did it through creating a douchebag character, Masshole, based on my dad, based <laughs> on all the bullies around me, named, and I can't do this, you know, in, in this voice, but Robbie Root Steamer, and he was a wrestler type, and I fronted a metal band that toured Warp Tour and did comedy songs, and I got a job on the Patriots, the New England Patriots rock radio station. The Patriots have a... They did, music station? They did back in the day. The Patriots were on 104.1 WPCN, which was our alternative rock station in Boston, uh, CBS. And so they would have the Patriots on Sunday. Oh, it wasn't like a Patriot-sponsored. Well, they would keep bragging about it. It's yeah. the Patriots rock radio station. Oh, okay. okay. Pearl Jam, Rob Gronkowski tight end, audio slave tickets, chicken wings, and like... Um, I created a character, and that's how I broke through creatively. They didn't like this in New England. They thought it was a bit uh, swish, a little bit effeminate. Uh, they, they, they don't like eccentric types. Um, they would prefer that we would die alone under bridges and not be creative. I mean, there's no creative uh, chance in New England. There's a cruel metal ceiling. You're not going to do comedy full time. You're not going to do music full time. And all these people knew it. So they would just sort of haze you every day and stuff like, how's your little band going? How's your little skit videos? I saw the link, dude. I didn't click on it. I'm sorry, you mad? And so how I got to California was I was doing the videos and doing everything and I wanted to work with, um, you know, performers, wrestlers, like Andy Kaufman. I love Andy Kaufman. Uh, yeah. And I found this lady wrestler over in Japan named China, wrestled for the WWE, incredible woman. I sent her some of my comedy videos <coughs> of me being Robbie Road Steamer, which was pretty much impersonating her boyfriends in wrestling. She loved it. She came back to America, and we went cross-country four years ago and came here. 
So is this after China's like uh, success in WWE? Yes. She went to Japan. I wish it was like one. <laughs> it was like she wrestled in the WWE um, and did a little bit of uh, porn, right. a tasteful tiny amount of porn, where she had uh, a lot of uh, dudes dress up as her ex-boyfriend wrestlers and go at her, and 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 she did a little wrestling over in Japan too, but a lot of porn. Okay. I mean, a real lot. It was a once she got a two for it, she was like, and um, and then after that. Um, she was pretty much labeled a sh uh, poo show, and, and um, she pretty much, um, she was uh, trolled. I mean, TMZ, um, Howard Stern, all those people, man, she looks like a man, huh? She's on steroids, she, she, she's got to be a man. Have you ever looked down there? What is it down there? Does she even have a vagina? And, and yeah, she was really depressed, and she was uh, coming off the rails, and she went to Japan to teach English as a second language for three and a half years. This woman spoke five different languages. She had a degree in Spanish literature. She was gonna be a CIA agent. I mean, she's very intelligent. And I found her over there and I'm like, hey, do you wanna come back to America? We'll do a documentary on you. I had a guy who worked for Ken Burns and Vice who did videos with me and she said, yeah. She had no other offers, her manager said. So she came back to America. I met her at JFK airport and we came out here. And that's how I came here. I'd never been to the West Coast before, four years ago, coming here in an SUV with China. <laughs> <laughs> what, what um, because she's, you know, become like, and oftentimes, unfortunately, this happens, is after someone passes is when their legacy really starts to, uh, they really start to get the respect. But she's become kind of like this legendary person now. Yeah. What would you say was the, the uh, not misconception, but like a, a fun fact about China. I got a lot of fun facts. That would about be her. like, uh, you know, like oh, uh, not surprising, but you'd be like, oh yeah, that sounds about right. Oh, um, the, <laughs> like her favorite food, a hobby, some personal detail that's going to get lost, you know, in the legend. Yeah, uh, she played concert quality cello, which was pretty phenomenal. There you go. Um, not too many people know about that. I mean, like I said before, she spoke five um, languages. Five languages. Yeah. She could bench 360, which is you know, probably known. People would figure that. And she was a dork, just a complete outsider, almost like a Janis Joplin style. Just uh, you knew she didn't quite fit in with the cool kids. And but she was really cool. She was amazing. She but was she just the biggest in. dork. Yeah. I mean, she was born um, upstate New York, and she trained in Massachusetts. And her and her boyfriend, Triple H, had a house up in New Hampshire. So there was a lot of New England. We understood the humor. I mean, we were just, I mean, she was only four years older than me, and we were just like two peas in a pod. I mean, I ended up living with her in Redondo Beach for like three months. She had the couch, I had the floor. She makes smoothies every morning, and it was like, it was just surreal. It felt like being in the movie Almost Famous with Wrestlers. And she was like Kate Hudson in, in just terms of trying to protect me and like warning me who was a troublemaker and everything. And um, I, I just, I mean, I fell in love with the state of California through her. I didn't ever want to go back. Um, she ended up dying. She died of a drug overdose. They found her on 4-20-2016. So that ruined that holiday for me for the rest of my life. Um, and... I tried to go back to Massachusetts and all my old friends were like, hey, it didn't work out out there, huh? You took the flight of failure back, huh, dude? And I'm like, well, China died. Yeah, 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 dude, did you do her though? Ah, uh, well, I mean, I'm suffering right now, I'm hurting. Yeah, 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 dude, so what are you gonna do, landscaping? What are you gonna do back here now, Bobby? You gonna wear your little queer leggings now everywhere? And I couldn't take it, so I got on a tour with Vermin Supreme courtesy of tour manager Philip Shive mm -hmm. and got enough money thanks to uh, that tour to come back out here and I didn't look back after that again. <laughs> and I hear you're always uh, kind of like me, you're always hustling to get on different TV shows. Um, well, you're on Ellen, right? Y yeah, but it wasn't like, um, I gotta get on that dirty Ellen show, man, if I get one more TV credit. Um, I was desperate for money and I got a job 
being the head scarer for Warner Brothers' It Haunted House. They, Warner Brothers themselves made this haunted house to promote the movie, and they used a lot of props and costumes from the movie, and I didn't know anything about haunting and whatnot. I went into like two haunted houses when I was a kid, but I had the body for it, like in terms of wearing the costumes, which most of these haunters apparently weren't. They were more sort of auditioning for big chubby trolls, which the movie didn't have. And yeah, I mean, I, I got on Ellen because they had the haunted house on the Warner Brothers lot and she does her show there and they decided to uh, have her go through and so I chased her around the haunted house and, and um, told her I live in a closet and since she was coming out of the closet as a lesbian, it was an alley-oop to her to say, come out of the closet, you know, it's freer. I did that, I did background acting on Westworld and American Horror Story and Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And I got on ABC, The Gong Show. Network television. Network television, prime time. That's my next goal. Um, on cable, never on network. <sighs> You're ahead of me, Rob. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> I had to sneak through so much barbed wire for them to put me on. I was like Hannibal Lecter, because they saw my protest videos on YouTube going around to Occupy events with Vermin Supreme, and they're like, okay, can we have a sheet of the lyrics you're going to sing? And I'm like, sure. And the gong show back in the day was really cool. It was, uh, it was public access-y. It, yeah. It was hosted by Chuck Barris, who's just a legend in his own right, newlywed game, uh, was in the CIA, the CIA apparently. Yeah. Yeah. And um, basically, that's what I auditioned for. I thought that show. Unfortunately, that was not the new gong show. It was done by Will Arnett and a lot of his angry, stubborn, bully comedian friends. And all they wanted to do was haze the weirdos. They wanted to gong every weirdo. And I knew that. And I knew they were going to gong me. And so I planned that whenever I saw their little asses go up to try to gong me, I would say, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with my song. You can't gong someone after they're set. I mean, what are you gonging? You're gonging the post what? So it worked. They tried to gong me. I said I was done. And then the program director said he beat the gong and the crowd went nuts because they thought I won something. And I didn't. I just beat them trying to eliminate me. And they gave me an encore because of it, because the crowd was going nuts, even though Will Arnett obviously hated me. Um, Alison Brie looked like I took a crap on her meal. Um, and I got like uh, four grand, uh, two grand more than the winner, um, also because I lied to them. And they said, is this song you're playing, which was called Hot Dogs and Applesauce, I have a song called that, um, is this published? Can we publish it? And I was like, sure, you can publish it. And they wouldn't let the song on unless they controlled the rights, or at least thought they controlled the rights. Yeah. So I did the paperwork, and um, I just didn't tell them that I published it in 2012 with BMI. And so BMI went after them again. So how that, did you just call up BMI and said, hey, they're using no. my song? BMI no, I didn't it. even think of that. I didn't even think. They literally just noticed that on um, ABC prime time they noticed a song and my name happened to be with it they had to pair me up with the name and then like it went through their little algorithms or whatnot and they're like no you owe him um, well a lot of money for an original song on prime time television and 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 the gong show ABC and Sony hated that they give every contestant for their network television debut two hundred dollars that's what you got to be on Thursday night, 10 p.m., by yourself doing whatever you're doing in front of the world, $200, plus the worst craft service I have ever had on earth. It was like what was it? Will Arnett hated little chocolate chip cookies that were like communion wafers. They were so thin and so miserable. And you could tell this is what Will Arnett thought of the people on that goddamn show. We were nothing. We were slaves. And I took that energy and I robbed him from so much money that they did not have. They probably had to take it out of Mike Myers' budget because Mike Myers was hosting the show being a Tony Clifton wannabe. It, it, it's always very, very frustrating to me when someone who doesn't get weirdness tries to appropriate it like that. It's almost like a cultural appropriation in a way, not as extreme, but it's, it's, it's taking someone's thing that they're doing because it's a part of their, who they are. Yeah. And, and just sort of stuffing it into a box. Well, but. it is because 
Contemporary comedy, the alternative side, the risky side, is probably people like Will Arnett and Arrested Development. That's the safe side of alternative yeah. comedy. Anything further west than that is just insane people, crazy people. The people like Matthew Silver, the people like Vermin Supreme, who I think are pretty much the heads of the alternative comedy movement, because alternative in this term means the culture. You know, Bill Burr always says, oh, alternative comedy. How can you be alternative from comedy? It's like it's not the comedy. that's all. It's the culture. It's the people that it attracts, the scene, the vibe. They need a new word for it because, yeah, alternative rock is like yeah. the alternative to mainstream rock. Yeah. Alternative comedy is instead of going to a comedy club, you go to a comic book store. It's the space is the alternative. Yeah, it's or, the same yeah, so my girlfriend, blah, blah, that's the same yeah. BS. Or like a park to see Matthew Silver perform. But the thing of it is, people like that have been bastardized to not even be comedians. Like, the common, the norms will not admit that people like Matthew Silver or Vermin Supreme are comedians. They're crazy people that you can make into funny memes that have no concept of what they're doing. They're just crazy, avoidable people. And I mean, it's a shame because a lot of those people know what they're doing and they're pretty devastating at what they do comically, but they don't really, it's unfortunate because people don't know how to pitch them or put them on a TV show, or even if they did, they don't want to. Well, and probably the majority of comedy fans want something pretty close to center. You, you and I yeah, have yeah. been around a while. We want to, we want the most unhinged person yeah. in the worst. We want to see like the depths of human uh, capabilities. Whereas the majority of people do just want to hear about dry cleaning or they do, and that was the most disappointing part. Yeah, I mean, when I do comedy clubs, a lot of times I want to go at the crowd. I hate the crowd. I don't like tourists. I know a lot of these people would have never sat with me on the bus, and they alienate me. And now I have to make all these people laugh when I don't want it, when I don't even enjoy the sports bar climate that a lot of these comedy clubs have to be put into and stuff. And it's a mind effort like that because Bill Hicks was like that a lot. Hicks hated a lot of his dumbed down American audiences that were just content with stupid observations about relationships at Applebee's yeah. or oh, faces. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, or, you know, you ever notice that um, if you go on a date on Tinder and like all this, and you're right, that's what a lot of people want. And, and it's sad because a lot of struggling, sad artists don't realize that. They're killing themselves thinking it's the industry. Oh, you know, it's the government that's holding back, you know, what could happen. And it's not, it's 90% of your brothers and sisters that want to live out their lives and live in a structure and want their comedy safe and don't want to. Um, yeah, it, it, it took a long time for me to realize that. And once I did, I uh, loaded up on a lot of food and, um, um, a lot of uh, guns and I, I hid because I, I can't do anything in this world if if I can't make my money off of art and whatnot what am I gonna do and it was humbling it was humbling to realize what America really wants and they're gonna want it I mean we're getting further and further from the generations that uh, used art um, as a movement like the 60s you know um, Art's becoming more and more, you know, washed away with each generation into pop culture nothingness. You know, kids now are not trained to write the perfect rock song because they want to take over the world, end the war in Vietnam, and feed the hungry. The they want <laughs> the perfect rock song's already been written, though. The problem is, is a lot of these paradigms have already been perfected yeah. before we were even born. You know, so to try to do it all over again it's never going to be as exciting but they do try you know right I because mean, well it's hard to start something totally new that's why the 60s yeah. were so crazy yeah. because it's all this new stuff because it was first generation and all these rock stars were going through it the first time and they had no wikipedia to look at and be like oh man everybody already did this before me why should i be elvis yeah. and the thing of it now is a lot of your rock stars comedians they're geeks they're hipsters that study everything yeah, and they're not these crazy, wild people because those people would not make it through the filters now. Those people are going to be ostracized very early on with uh, probably uh, psych meds or standardized testing to get them weaned out, and they don't have a chance. And, yeah, a lot of our rock stars, comedians, actors, and the creme de la creme are, you know, all, all, all nerds, hipsters, not our wild people that want to die in their own vomit. 
Where's our heroes now? <laughs> well, we have actually a hero right here, you, um, and you're going to do one of your songs for us right now. We sure. only have about two minutes left. Okay. Um, but if you could put, uh, I know you have your guitar, however you want to do it. Yeah. I don't know, if you just share some of your music in this era, ASMR style. Absolutely. Take us out, and we won't gone you. Yeah. Uh, once again, folks, my name is Louis Robert Patillo, and um, this is my and wash. you're lefty. Yeah, I play a lefty guitar. I play a right-handed guitar upside, upside down. Like, uh, so the, string, the strings are upside down. Yeah. Actually, Jimmy Hendrix... He's strung it upside down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, like uh, my friend Sean plays it this yeah. way. And it's not the right way to play, but thank God, you know, there's a lot of comedy in my work. So yeah. this song is called Hot Dogs and Applesauce. Gonna work at Best Buy and snort clonopins, hey. Hot dogs and applesauce, come on. Hot dogs and applesauce, one time. Hot dogs and applesauce, gonna snort Adderall and work at Best Buy, come on. Hot dogs and applesauce, and maybe we'll get married one day. You guys have got it? Let's do another verse. Here we go. Gonna vote for Bernie and end the Matrix, hey. Hot dogs and applesauce. One time. Hot dogs and applesauce. Come on. Hot dogs and applesauce. Gonna go home and smoke DMT. Come on. Hot dogs and applesauce. And maybe we'll get married one day. You guys have been a beautiful audience. I have a merch table outside in the car in my trunk. Last verse. Oh, nine, oh, 11 was an inside job. Uh, Come on. Hot, hot dogs, dogs and applesauce. Apple Come on. Hot dogs and applesauce. Come on. Hot dogs and applesauce. Oh, JFK was an inside yeah, job. Yeah, he shot I'm himself. Sure. Yeah. Hot dogs and, and applesauce. Apple and maybe we'll get married one day. very quiet cheering yeah. across the internet exactly. and Pasadena. <gasps> well, Rob, thank you so much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you should all go out in the comedy scene and see Rob and Furman Supreme and all that. Uh, thank you for all tuning in. Until next time, this is Adam Papagan reminding you that there's a place you can go and it's your mind. Good night. Good night. Good night. Gone.